A lot of you here were alive in the 60s. This is what was going on in Canada, in Quebec in the 1960s. Murray was eventually sentenced to one year in prison because he led a 17-year-old French-Canadian young man to the Lord. He was sentenced to one year in jail for that. The day before his jail term was supposed to start, the jail burned down. <laughs> and it was next door to the fire department. Wow. And it burned down, and the judge said, well, because the jail's no longer there, we can't put you in jail, so you can go. That next Sunday, Murray preached a sermon on the God who answers by fire. He is God. Mm. And this was the status of what was going on in Quebec from 18, from the, all through the 1800s and up till the 1960s. In the 1960s, the Great Revolution took place, just like in this country. People started to throw off all authority, but in Quebec, that authority was the Catholic Church. The other authority was the English. We don't want to be part of Canada anymore. We don't want to have the English people telling us what to do. We want to, we want to be our own people. So, you can see the slide there on the right. It says, now or never, masters of ourselves. And this little window of rebellion against all authority opened the opportunity for the gospel to come into Quebec, where the Catholic Church had it so locked down before. People were in the process of trying all new things, rejecting all authority. They said, well, we'll listen to what the Protestants have to say for the first time. And so in 1967, uh, you can see the picture on the left there, the little girl with the camera. I love that picture because it exudes all the confidence of the 1960s. And uh, it says... Rendezvous à Montréal, bring your camera, apportez vos graphes à Ray. Great, this is going to be great. It was kind of like the World's Fair, Expo 67. The Montreal Expo, so the baseball team, was launched as part of this exposition. And what it was is kind of a World's Fair kind of thing, and they had all these pavilions from around the world and technology pavilions. Well, some Christian businessmen from the city of Toronto built a pavilion, and they translated moody sermons from science films into French, and they ran 900,000 people through that pavilion during the six months of the Montreal Exposition. Wow. Out of the 900,000 French speakers that went through that pavilion, 200,000 signed the decision slip that they had prayed to receive Christ. 200,000 people in the six month period. Mm. By 1970, all of a sudden, little French churches started to pop up like mushrooms. Now when I say little, you would be a very, very big church for Quebec at that time. I'm talking five, six people. The very first French Canadian believers. And all through the 70s, you can see there, pray for Quebec. All through the 70s, and up until about 1985, we experienced Acts chapter 2. We had people coming to know Christ. We had Amen. man bring his brother to the Lord, bring his business, his, uh, business associate, bring his mother. Every single week, churches would have someone who got saved that week. In the mid-80s, that water was turned down to a trickle by the Lord. That flood of converts became a trickle. And we had, in the church, by 1985, a bunch of people zealous for the Lord who had all been a Christian for about two to five years. So you can imagine what that creates. That creates a lot of zeal, but not a lot of wisdom. And because of that, we have had some cataclysmic church fights. Uh, when you have a bunch of new Christians, you can have all kinds of problems. And these are church fights that I would pay money to watch. I would buy tickets. <laughs> I mean, these are, we have had some, some top-notch church funds. And so the church in Quebec has fractured to the point where three out of four people who today have evangelical belief attend no church. They've been turned off, they've been put off, maybe their fault, maybe the church's fault, maybe both. But they've been, put, they've been put off and they're not in church. And so we have a very small percentage of Christians, about 10 times lower than the United States, and 75% of those attend no church. This is the status of the church in Quebec. Now, I want to give you a little bit of my background. My family is English-Canadian. My mother was born in Windsor, across from Detroit. My dad was born in Toronto. And my family, as English-Canadians, did not like French-Canadian people. From the time I was very small, I was taught that French-Canadians were no good. You don't want to have anything to do with them. Don't ever go there. Don't ever go to Quebec. We don't like them. When we went to Quebec as missionaries, one of my aunts, my mother's younger sister, took us out of her will. She said, if you would go there to those people, you get nothing from me. Yeah. So this is the level of friendship that existed. Now, I'm going to come back to Quebec. I want to look at the Bible passage. First of all, I just want to say, I'm going to ask you if you want to sign up to pray for us uh, a little bit later on. And so if you'd like to do that, these are going to, Tim is going to circulate this clipboard. There is no obligation. Uh, we're going to send you prayer requests if you sign up. And we would love to have you pray for us. So that clipboard is going to be going around, and I can talk to you more about it, and I will talk to you more about it during the presentation this morning. Alright, now, let's look at Acts 1.8. 
Acts 1 8. Understanding Jesus' last words. In Acts 1 8, Jesus said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. Now, when we think about that, I do not believe that Jesus said things by accident. Jesus wasn't just thinking, yeah, you should be my witnesses in Jerusalem, uh, Judea, where else? Uh, Samaria. Oh yeah, and everybody. Every word that Jesus said had uh, a reason. Amen. So if we go, let's break this down a little bit. Okay, Jerusalem, that's the city where they were when Jesus was talking, when he said this verse. So it makes sense, he would tell them, reach the people around here in our area, with, tell them about me. Okay, I got that. Reach Judea. That's the country. Jerusalem is the capital. Judea is the country. Reach the people in Judea. It'd be kind of like saying, reach Lynch Lynchburg, reach Yellow Branch, reach Rustburg, reach Campbell County, reach the United States. Then we'll skip over Samaria for a second. And then he says, go to the rest of the world. Go to the ends of the earth. Everywhere. Mongolia, Japan, Africa. Go everywhere. But what's this Samaria thing? Why Samaria? Was it because it's just a country next door to Judea? But they had other neighbors. They had other countries next door. They had Egypt that was next door. They had Edomea, which in the New Testament time was called Edomea, and in the Old Testament was called Edom. That was next door. It there are all these other people that he could have said, other neighboring countries. Why would he just pick that one? Why, why Samaria? Why that country? Because he clearly says, you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other most part of the earth. So I want to think about, why did Jesus say Samaria? For what reason? All right, a little background. 1 Kings 16, 23 to 30. Let's find out where Samaria came from and what it is. 1 Kings 16, 23. And you can turn there, or you can just let me read it. You can listen, whatever you want. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king of Israel, and he reigned 12 years, six of them in Tirzah. He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver and built a city on the hill, calling it Samaria, after Shemer, the name of the former owner of the hill. But Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. He walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and in his sin, which he had caused Israel to commit so that they provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger by their worthless items. As for the other events of Omri's reign and, and what, what th he did and the things he achieved, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Omni wrestled with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab, his son, succeeded him as king. In the 38th year, let me see, I have to work here. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab's son of Omri became king of Israel. He reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Okay, background on Samaria. Omri, uh, if you have studied ancient Near Eastern history, you know that Omri, as the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, is actually kind of somebody. You can read about him in the secular history books. He kind of did big stuff. He was kind of a, he was an important king of Israel as far as secular history is concerned. In the Bible, he gets like five verses. Why? Because Amir was a loser. He was a loser according to God. He was a spiritual loser. And his kid was a real chip off the old block. He was worse. Ahab, worst king that Israel ever had. Amen. No one had done more evil than Ahab ever did. Now the picture that you see there, that is the hill of Samaria. Uh, that's a picture of the current hill of Samaria where the town was on that hill. Now, so when any person in Israel would hear Samaria, the very first thing, if they go back to the beginning, where did Samaria come from? They go back to the beginning, they go back to evil city founded by evil Omri and a stupid son, Ahab. His wicked, evil son, his wife was Jezebel. I won't even get right. into that. Amen. It was founded by them. So already Samaria, not a good place. There was not one good king of Israel, of the northern kingdom. Not one that loved God. Not one that obeyed his commandments. Now, let's go to 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17, and we're going to read about the fall of Samaria. So, from the time of Ahab in about 800 B.C. to the fall of Samaria. I won't ask my Bible school students to give me a date, but that's 722 B.C. I'm sure they don't do that. Uh, 2 Kings 17, 6 to 18. And I'm going to read uh, from there. And basically, this is the laundry list of why God destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. In the ninth year of Hosea, Hosea, the king of Assyria, 
The ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hava and Gozan on the Havar River and in the towns of the Medes. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who brought them out, out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices of the kings of Israel and their The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that, that were not right. From Watchtower, a fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. They set up sacred stones and asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. At every high place, they burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. They did wicked things and provoked the Lord to anger. They worshipped idols. The Lord had said, You shall not do this. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, Turn from your evil ways. Observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your fathers to obey and that I delivered you to, that I delivered to you through my servants and prophets. But they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their fathers who did not trust the Lord their God. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their fathers and the warnings he had given them. They followed worthless idols and, and they themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. And they did the, they did the things the Lord had forbidden them to do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made themselves two idols cast in the shape of calves and an Asherah bowl. They bowed down to all the starry hosts and they worshipped Baal. They sacrificed their sons and daughters in the fire. They practiced divination and sorcery and sold themselves to do evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. So the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them from his presence. Only the tribe of Judah was left. Verse 24. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuthath, Abba, Hamath, Sepharvarim, and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. They took over Samaria and lived in its towns. All right, so here's the story. Wicked city founded by a wicked king. His wicked son makes it worse. Through its entire history, the city is a place that does not honor God. There's that whole list of stuff that I just read. Mm -hmm. God says, he warns them, he sends prophets, he warns them, he warns them, he warns them, time's up, boom. The Assyrians, the most vicious civilization that has ever existed, even till this day, worse than the Nazis, the most vicious civilization comes in, they tear them away, they take them away, they, they, take, they leave a, a few of the, of the riffraff. So they take pretty much everybody. Anybody that's important, they take them away. They settle them in other countries. They're gone. And the, the writer of Second Kings tells us why. Because, this is a, because they didn't obey the Lord. And so the king of Assyria says, as part of his policy of destabilizing people who could be rebellious, he takes people from someplace else. Where should we send them? I want you to send them to Samaria. There's nobody else. Yeah, we'll send them to Samaria. They send them over there. So now these people move in. And so you have non-Jewish people living in the Jewish country in a city that have been a wicked Jewish city and they're repopulated and they're mixing with the Jews that were left. The, the rabble, the riffraff that was left. So now during the next 750 years, it's a long time, people in the United States, 250 years old, 750 years, these people kind of form their own culture, their Samaritan culture. It's a mix of people who came from all over. They brought their gods with them. They brought their ideas. They mixed with the Jews who were not good Jews at all. And they kind of form this, this own conglomeration religion of people that are kind of half Jewish. So, naturally, Jews are not too keen on this. As a matter of fact, they say, the, the Samaritans say, well, we're Jews, but we don't believe anything except the first five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We don't believe the rest of it. None of the prophets, we don't believe that. Why not? Well, because they say bad things about us. <laughs> they say bad things about us, like we just read. You know, the kind of thing like people do today. Well, I don't believe that part of the Bible because it tells me I'm a bad person. <laughs> exactly. People have not changed. So the Samaritans said, no, 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 we don't believe that part. We only believe the, the Pentateuch, the first five books. And the Jews said, well, you can't come to our temple because, well, you're not pure Jews. You can't come in. They said, well, that's fine. We'll build our own temple. So they build their own temple on Mount Gerizim, and they have that temple. And they say, well, this is the real temple, not your temple. 750 years later, Jesus steps into this scenario. Now, let's look at a couple of passages. Luke 9, 51 to 56. And if you're looking for that in the Bible, Luke 9, 51 is right after Luke 9, 50. We're good. <laughs> All right. Let me take a little refresh here. 
and I'm good to go. Luke 9, 51. As the time approached for him, to be that's Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into the Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and burn these people with a little crispy piece of bacon? But Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. Now let's think about this for a second. The disciples, they saw Jesus reject a lot of times. They, they saw people who didn't believe in Jesus. They never said, Lord, we can burn them right now if you like. But I didn't know they had that much faith. We'll call down fire from heaven and burn these Samaritans. Well, you guys are a little too excited about this, right? <laughs> Why? Because these Samaritans are people we already hate. Any excuse to burn a Samaritan is a good one. So Jesus, just say the word, we'll be happy to call down some lightning bolts on these Samaritans. And Jesus says, nah, I'm not about that. Let's move on. All right, next passage. Luke 10, 30-37. The good, quote-unquote, Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must they do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself and sound like some kind of theologians that I know. And he says, well, who is my neighbor, actually? And Jesus says, hmm. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after me, <coughs> he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Think about this passage for a second. So the, you have this man, this uh, expert in the law, going to quiz Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus, he and Jesus are talking, and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells him, how do you read the law? He gives the right answer. But then, like any good theologian, he comes up with a qualifier. Yeah, but we don't really know what that means exactly, the neighbor. And Jesus says, well, i got a story for you. And he tells him this story, and the story is, now you have to understand, the expert in the law would not think that the Levite is a good person. He would not think that the priest is a good person. If I put this in the terms of, of our modern day theology, it would be like if someone was broken down out here on 29, and, and I told you, and you asked me, Who, who's my neighbor? And I said, well, first of all, a woman pastor from the Methodist Church came along. You would think, not a good person. Someone who doesn't honor the Word of God. Then I'd say, and then someone else came along from uh, some other weird Christian science church, and you'd be like, and they went by. You'd be like, yeah, not a good person. So you see, Jesus is setting this teacher of this expert in the law up. He said, he tells him, like, the person that you wouldn't agree with too much goes by. Then he, someone else you wouldn't agree with too much, a Levite, he goes by. And so the teacher of the law is expecting that he's going to say, and then you know an expert in the law, a nice Pharisee. He came by. He saved the day. And but Jesus doesn't do that. He says, who came by? A Samaritan. The people you all hate. <laughs> the worst one yet. He came by. What does he do? He does the right thing. He takes care of him. He gives him two silver points to take care of him. If he needs anything else, let me know. I'll pay. And this guy is so befuddled by this comment. And Jesus says, who, who acted like a neighbor? He can't even say Samaritan. What does he say? The one who had pity on him. He can't even say the word from his mouth. The good guy was a Samaritan. He can't say it. And Jesus says, well then just go be like that somewhere. Mm -hmm. Alright, next passage. Oh, that is my last passage. I have another one, but I'm not going to take the time to do that. The Jews hated the Samaritans. That's right. Yet, Jesus tells them, those people are the people you have to go to. The Gospels for all people. 
Amen. The gospel is for each person, no matter how much they're like you, no matter how much you might dislike them, the gospel is for all people. And this is the reason I'm convinced why Jesus said Samaria. That you would go to people who you do, do not have a natural affinity towards. Now I'm going to come back to this in a couple of minutes. I want to tell you a little bit about our ministry. When we became missionaries, lo, these 23 years ago, we went out with three principles of mission. Our first principle of mission was ask for prayer only. Now we're getting ready to go be missionaries. A lot of people said to us, are you going to go around, you're going to ask for money, you're going to shake the bushes and have people fill up pledge cards and put up a picture of, you know, of a, a, some, in some way to try to get extra money. And, and we said, no, no, no. We think that if God is hiring us, God will pay us. So we're going to ask people, we're going to go around to churches just like this. We're going to ask people to pray for us just like I sent that clip word around. And when we get, at that time, we wanted to get 60 different people per day. So 60 times 7, 420 people would sign up to pray for us one day per week. Just Tuesday or just Friday or just Wednesday. When we get those, we're going to go. And if God is really hiring us, then God is going to pay us. We're not going to go out and ask people to support us because we're not working for them. We're working for God. It's kind of like the girl at McDonald's. If you have a girl at McDonald's who, who, when she gets hired, she doesn't say to the owner of McDonald's, could I just see your bank account? I just want to know if you're going to be able to pay me in two weeks. She has faith that the owner of McDonald's, if, he, if he's hiring her, he's going to pay her. She doesn't say to the customer over the counter, I'm not sure if the manager can go pay me, so do you, do you have like five bucks? You can do it. She doesn't do that because she believes that the manager of the McDonald's, if he hired her, he can, he can pay her. So we said, when we became missionaries, we're going to go, we're going to ask people to pray, and we're going to trust the Lord to provide. 23 years later, as you can see, I'm definitely not starving. <laughs> the Lord has taken care of us. Amen. And by asking for prayer only, it frees us and gives us the opportunity to minister to people because we're never asking for money. A lot of people told us we were crazy when we became missionaries. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. That's just in Bible times. It doesn't work that way nowadays. They said, well, we're going to find out. And 23 years later, God has provided for us to his glory. Next, build local churches. Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say I'll build my camp. He didn't say I'll build my mission. He didn't say I'll build my Bible school. He didn't say I'll build my Christian university. He didn't say I'll build my one club. He said I'll build my church. Now, all of those things I just mentioned are good if they help build the local church. Why the local church? Because the local church is a microcosm of the whole body of Christ. In the local church, you have tall people, you have short people, you have fat people, you have skinny people, you have beautiful people, most are not. But you have all kinds of people <laughs> in the local church. And so anybody that comes into the local church can feel like, there's somebody like me, I can fit in here. I can be, I can be part of this congregation because they're just normal people like me. Mm -hmm. And so our focus has been to go into lo French-speaking local churches, teach them how to do youth ministry, get, the, get a youth ministry going, and reach young people in each community through the local church. Next, our third principle of mission was active discipleship. Now, a lot of people think that discipleship is going up here to the restaurant and getting coffee and donut and having a Bible study. Now, I am totally a believer in donuts. I love them. But when I look at the only two people in the New Testament who make disciples, I don't see that. The only two people in the New Testament who make disciples, Jesus and Paul. What they do with their disciples is say, come on, boys, let's go. They take them with them. They involve them in what they have been called to do. They're taking them along, and as they go, they're teaching them, they're experiencing things, they're getting involved. And so we said active discipleship means we're going to take our own family with us. We've gone on mission trips all over the world. All of our kids have been to more than 28 countries. We've gone all over the world. God has provided for it. We've also slept on the floor, so <coughs> 120 degrees outside. But God has provided for it. Active discipleship of our own kids. If God calls us, that means you, because you're our kids, so you're going with us. And as we train teenagers and we reach teenagers, that means God's calling us. And if, if you want to come, we want you to come, because we're going to go serve together. Disciples are made by actively including them in what God has called us to do. So these were our three principles of mission. we got five minutes. All right, now... Our, for our two ministries are reaching youth and mobilizing missionaries. First of all, local church youth ministry. We, are, we go into a French-speaking local church. We train leaders. We write curriculum. I write quiet time questions, Bible, daily Bible reading questions. I've written about 
2,000 questions. The kids can have a short passage, read those questions, two questions, write down an answer each day to help French teenagers develop the habit of reading the Bible every day. I give those to churches. Actually, those questions we've given out all over the world. We have churches in Japan, churches in in uh, Finland, churches in Malta, churches in Germany, Spain, uh, in Senegal, using those questions. And we just give them away. We're not interested in trying to make money. We're interested in building a church. And we have curriculum that we give to every church to teach the Bible to young people. And so we develop a youth ministry in the local church. After that gets going well, we go on to another church. So for the last 23 years, that's what we've been doing. We're finishing our fourth church June 14th. It will be our last day at our fourth church. So we're very excited about what God has done. We have seen 100 kids that we have worked with go to Bible school uh, over the last 23 years. And about uh, 20 of those have gone into full-time ministry, which we thank the Lord for. Our second ministry is JET, Just Build Extremity La Tire, which uh, means in French, to the ends of the earth. And it's a mission that we started to mobilize French, the French church to get involved in missions. Because the French church, because there are so few Christians, sometimes there's a mentality of, yeah, but there aren't too many of us, so we don't have too much money, so the Americans, they can do missionary work. But that doesn't fit with what Jesus said. You might not be able to do as much. You can do something. Everybody can do something. And so we started a mission to get French-Canadian kids involved in, in mission trips. We take them over. We serve missionaries. Many of those kids have gone on to Bible school. About 50% of them have gone on to Bible school. And we're very thankful for what God has done. Three of those kids who traveled with us as kids are now missionaries with us. We sent them out as missionaries. And uh, one couple, married couple, working in Slovakia. Single ladies working in Japan. So we're very excited about what God is doing through the ministry of Jeff. Next, the next thing that we feel like God is leading us to do is we're starting a one-year Bible mission study program called St. Patrick's Chalet. And that's where it's going to be bilingual. We want to bring kids in, uh, and we're going to teach them the Bible. We're going to teach them how to do ministry, missions. And, and then the last three months of their year with us will be a mission trip overseas. Where we will continue to teach them by internet, and they will be involved with local populations. So if you can pray for this, we need about a million bucks to do this. To build the building and everything else, we have no doubt the Lord can do it. But if you would join us in praying for that, that the Lord provide money, Lord provide people at just the right time. Now, the last question that I have is, who is your Samaritan? It's easy for us to point fingers at the Jews and be like, oh man, those guys, what a wreck. But you know, we all have Samaritans. It could be a neighbor. It could be a member of your extended family. It could be a person of a different race. But the question is, who's your Samaritan? Because God wants to reach that person through you. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. And so I want you to take a minute and just before the Lord, ask the Lord, Lord, do, do I have a Samaritan? And if so, show me who it is. It could be a co-worker. The person that nobody in your neighborhood likes. That one family that everybody just thinks is nuts. Who's that Samaritan in your life that God wants to reach through you? Because that's exactly the command that Jesus gave to us. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for this morning. I want to thank you for your word, how it is so old, yet so up-to-date and so pertinent and relevant to our everyday life. I want to pray that you would reveal to us any Samaritans that we may have in our, in our everyday life and help us to love them and make an active effort to try to reach them and show them your love and who you are. Thank you for this opportunity to share with these brothers and sisters this morning. I pray you would bless them. I pray that you would do great things here. And I pray that you would help each of us to accomplish exactly what you want us and what, you're, what you want us to do and what you're calling us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. And lastly, I'll say if you didn't sign up yet, uh, please sign up for